Brewing a deck is a lot like cooking. When you find a new recipe, even for a simple dish, there's likely a long list of necessary ingredients. But if you fancy yourself a home chef, you've probably got a bunch of them already. A baker doesn't go buy a teaspoon of salt every time they want to bake a pie, they just open the pantry. In the same way, having a collection of commander staples, love them or hate them, can make the deck brewing process much less overwhelming. If you already have a sprinkling of ramp, a dash of removal, and a few cups of card draw on hand, you can focus on the cards that really define your deck's unique flavor. So today, we're gonna lay out the staples of any deck builder's arsenal and help you stock your commander kitchen with the must-have cards for your commander collection. Before we start the episode, uh, we wanted to let everybody know out there there's actually something pretty cool going on. Yeah, a really special opportunity for one lucky winner. Post Malone has teamed up with Whatnot to give one person the chance to fly out to LA and play him live on the game of Commander for guess what? A hundred thousand dollars! <laughs> this is the chance of a lifetime. It's pretty easy to enter. Anybody could win. Mm -hmm. You just have to download the Whatnot app and then you need to go to postmalone.whatnot.com and bookmark that page because that is Post Malone's stream. And then on August 4th at 6 p.m. Pacific, the stream will go live. And during that stream, anybody who's in attendance will have a chance to be that person who's gonna play him in that 1v1 game of Commander. They're gonna fly you out to Los Angeles. Yep. So you're gonna play him in person and for a chance at 100 grand. But you have to be in the stream when it happens to click the enter giveaway button. And then as long as you're there, August 4th, 6 p.m. Pacific, you have a chance. This is incredible. This is a really once in a lifetime opportunity. And you know what, Josh and I, we wanna see one of our Command Zone fans out there being the winner. Yeah, I would love for it to be a Game Nice fan, a Command Zone fan yeah, uh, in that game so with Post cool. Malone. Uh, and I would love to see you winning the 100 thousand dollars and we're also going to be able to watch it because we're going to be there yeah that's right after you meet post malone you can meet the even bigger celebrities <laughs> that are at, at, in attendance at the event which is going to be us yeah we're going to be there commentating <laughs> the 1v1 match for a hundred thousand dollars when it happens but first we got to figure out who's going to be playing in that that's game right. remember august 4th 6 p.m pacific postmalone.whatnot.com download Go the app there now download the app we hope to see you there good luck Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. What's up, everybody? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I am once again joined by the wonderful... I'm DJ. Yay. Also known as... Jumbo Commander. Also known as... Um, the, the, the king of staples <laughs> <laughs> just made that up nice also known as okay you're just kidding uh, and I am Jimmy Wong also, also known, known as, as Jimmy Wong alright collections <laughs> today we are talking about something that's really uh, actually near and dear to both DJ and my heart which is building a collection that is actually functional for you as a commander player um, I've been playing magic for a long time I have a lot of cards that do not work in commander and those cards I don't want in my collection do I yeah, well, we we just naturally gather cards. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's great to, like, get our favorite cards, put them in binders and stuff like that. But we want our collections to serve a purpose, to help us make decks. And so we're going to talk mm -hmm. about those must-have cards for your commander collection so you can brew more and brew better. Gotta have them. Gotta have them. Must-have them. Staples, you know what they are. And you know what? When we talk about cards that you need to buy and get, because that's how this works, this whole thing, this hobby, you're going to need to go somewhere to get them. And you can go right now to Channel Fireball dot com slash command and check out their online marketplace it is where josh and i have been shopping for all of our sealed products recently because you're shopping from real lgs's they've get they got great rates you're also supporting a real local game store and they have singles sealed products more everything that you need on the channel fireball marketplace and if you use our affiliate code channelfireball.com slash command or just enter a promo code command at checkout you're gonna be supporting the show as well as getting the cards that you need straight delivered to your doorstep the best way and you can just put them right into your deck it's perfect and when when you get those cards, make sure you check out shop.ultrapro.com slash command. I have been buying stuff from this uh, place nonstop because they have great deals all the time on binders, deck boxes, sleeves, and more. I've recently been upgrading all of my sleeves once again because I wanted now the gloss versions of the Eclipse sleeves, and they are very, very nice. You can find all that stuff at shop.ultrapro.com slash command. And trust me, you're not going to want to miss out. There is a great deal going on almost every week, it seems like. And finally, last way to support the show is directly at patreon.com slash command zone. We love our patrons. We've been playing spell table games with them at certain tiers. 
Every patron has access to our Discord where they can ask us questions, and we have special exclusive bonus content for patrons at a select tier as well. So make sure you check that out, but also because we could shout your name out like we do for every episode for one lucky listener. And this week's episode is dedicated to Devin Tuck. Devin, you rock. Thanks, Devin. Okay, must-have cards for your commander collection. Uh, I love this topic because when I build my binders out, I want to be able to open it and know, cool, I have six soul rings here. I can just take one out and put it into my deck. I don't need to go search for it somewhere else. But you can apply that to the rest of your collection, right? Exactly. Um, So... One thing about building up a collection is that it's very personal. It's different for every person. Like, for example, one solution that we could offer is uh, get a little thing called a credit card and then just (laughs) buy all of the most expensive and played cards. And if you have every card, then you have all of the staples. Am I right? Yeah, that sounds like a bad (laughs) idea, DJ. So we're going to talk about how you can actually make this manageable for yourself by buying the cards that you need, but aren't necessarily going to break the bank because turns out these cards get played across multiple decks. Let's say you're just trying to put together a deck in the future to see if it works. You're not going to want to go out and have to buy all this extra stuff. You want to have a collection that's already going to have a lot of these sort of staples there. So you can just pull from it, build the deck, and then ask yourself, okay, do I upgrade that slot? If I do, I I know now without needing to make that purchase beforehand. Yeah, this solution that we're talking about here is actually for brewers, for builders, for people that want to try out a commander deck. Yeah. And uh, right now we have collections that are large enough that if we see a card, we can be like, oh, I'm going to build that. We only get a couple, like a handful of the specific cards, and then we fill the rest of the deck up with these staples, with these flexible cards that Mm -hmm. go in lots of different decks, and then we give it a try. Actually, this could end up saving you money because so often I've seen a deck that I've fallen in love with, Mm -hmm. and I've gone on the internet, I've gone on the marketplaces, and I've bought 100 cards. (laughs) The full deck. Yeah, I bought the full deck. You go home, and a week later, you're like, open the box up, and you're like, wait a minute, I had, what? I had this all along? Oh, man. Exactly. So if you have a list of staples that you can pull from, you're going to be building more decks more often because yep. the financial barrier is going to be lower. You're going to be able to build decks faster. And also, you're going to be able to pay attention to the critical components of a deck. Yeah. A lot of times, sometimes when I'm deck brewing, I will just go all in on the specific deck. Like I said, 100 cards. Right. Um, but sometimes I'll go all in at the exclusion of my fruits and vegetables. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like oh, of, your core things of that the you need. core yeah, things yeah. that you need in a deck, something that you need to make it work. And so these staples that we're going to introduce you to today, they help support brewing and they help support yep. new deck building. Yeah. And we're going to be budget conscious on this episode. Obviously, we always try and find things that aren't, we're not going to tell you a billion things that break the bank that would kind of defeat the purpose. But there are going to be some expensive cards along the way, because again, staples do mean that a lot of people play them. But that also means that they get reprinted a lot. In certain cases, we've seen Soul Ring, for instance, reprinted a thousand times. So the nice thing about all of these cards, though, is that they hold value too, mm-hmm. right? We see Soul Ring always creep back up in price, Arcane Signet, those types of cards, because people just need them in their decks. So even even if you get them now, it's not like in the future, they're not going to be worth anything. In fact, they may be worth more or just as valuable because they're staples. You're always going to be playing them. Exactly. Like this, by the way, you're not buying this for financial advice. No, you're, uh, bu- you're buying this for deck brewing. <laughs> you're buying this for deck brewing to having a collection, to have access to these cards. But it is nice to know that these are playable in almost every deck, like they're very universally playable. Yep. And so they will intrinsically hold value. And so the important thing is having it as a part of your collection, but it's a little bit of a plus side if you uh, might gain a little bit of value <laughs> over time yeah, in, you your, in your sort of portfolio for some of these cards. Yeah. And a final note, there are a lot of multicolored staples, but we're not going to try and talk about those today because they just don't fit in as many decks. If you have a Golgari card, it's black and green. That only goes in certain kinds of decks. It's way different than having an artifact or just a black or a green card, if that makes sense. Exactly. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't go out and get that Assassin's Trophy, especially if you yeah. uh, have easy access to it. You're like, oh, that's a good card. I'm going to get that and put it into my staple binder. And I always play black green or whatever. Exactly. So So it doesn't mean that you ignore those cards, but by definition, if 
they're not going to fit in as many decks. And so they're not going to be as critical a staple as some of these other cards that we're mentioning. And so that might yep. be something that you keep in the back of your mind is like, well, do I spend my limited resources on something that fits in fewer decks or do I pick a staple that fits in many, many decks? decks? That's right. Okay. And we've done a similar topic to this in the past, but of course magic gets updated and it's really exciting to get back to this topic because there's some new staples out there that we're going to love to talk about. So we've broken it down. We've got artifacts, lands, uh, smoothers, card draw, on all that good stuff mm -hmm. so let's jump right into a dj what is the first category for our staples and the must-have cards for well, your commander collection <laughs> one thing that you mentioned right off at the front was like soul ring yes right? because that seems to be the card that everyone always uses it goes in every single deck and so i want to start off with soul ring hopefully you have one. Yeah, very hopefully. If you've ever bought a pre-con, a soul ring came inside it. Exactly. So. <laughs> but, but artifacts are a good place to start too. Soul ring is really common, but also arcane signet, you know, mm -hmm. Felwar stone, solemn simulacrum. Yeah. These are some of the artifacts that can easily slot into every deck and they help support the mana development uh, phase of the game. Yeah. So arcane signet and Felwar stone are both two mana rock drops. Uh, there's plenty of these out there. You've got signets, you've got the talismans. Um, obviously, you know, we want to talk about the ones that can fit into any deck. So arcane signet taps for any color in your commander's color identity. Works great. Even if you're playing a mono red deck, by the way, and Felwar stone, you can add mana of any color that in the land that your opponents could produce. So that could be theoretically all five of the colors in any given game. Yeah. You mentioned the Sigmunds and the Talismans. Those are, again, great staples. But the reason why we're not highlighting them here is because they have to go in decks that are two colors. And yep. so they're less useful than, say, an Arcane Signet. Although I will say, if you just want to grab a bunch of the Signets or the Tal... I like the Talismans a little bit more to be able to just tap it for uh, something the turn it comes down. Mm -hmm. They were just reprinted in Modern Horizons 2. So there's a great chance to go pick those up as well but tailor it to the decks that you're building don't just sort of get all of them and expect all of them to be useful because you may never build that boros deck that uses that red white signet oh and solemn simulacrum we should talk about this card this card's been around forever it's one of those cards that when i first started playing with it oh gosh almost six seven years ago i thought in my head then this is a staple and turns out it's a staple now people out there in the world are saying that they're over it. It's overrated. Yeah, it's, it's not too a much mana, four mana. Too, yeah. What do you say about that? I think if you're just building a deck and you just want it to function, one of the biggest things is not missing on those land drops, as old Jimmy Wong knows. So <laughs> I think four mana is a great slot for a Solemn to sit at because it has the added ability of when it dies, you get a draw card. And attacking and blocking is way more important today than it was even a few years ago because of Goad and all these new mechanics. So I think having Solemn as a blocker, also a lot more sacrifice outlets out there means that it's actually really worth it. I think if your deck obviously is super optimized and you can't fit that four drop in there, then fine, don't play it. But I would say for any deck power seven level or below, you're going to be totally fine running this. It's going to fix your mana and it's going to potentially draw you a card as a good blocker. Well, one thing that we're also going to find as we transition into the next category, which is ramp spoiler, we've been talking about artifact ramp, uh, is that Solemn's going to slot into some decks way more than others because yeah. our support for ramp as these staples is much like it's not as well covered in yeah, some mono categories. Mono white, mono red. Solemn seems like a much better choice than mono yeah. green, obviously. Uh, yeah, so I think that Solemn uh, might be highlighted or really uh, important in some of these other colors. Yeah, and if you love building sacrifice decks or artifact decks, then Solemn's even better. But I think the base case scenario, again, if you're just building out a binder and you need things to put into decks, if you're trying to flush out that 100 cards without going crazy on your yeah, budget. Yeah, nothing's wrong with Solemn. It's great. Solemn. Yeah. yeah, and the price tag on it's gone down like crazy, so it's a great pickup. All right. Um, so, so transitioning into ramp, let's talk about the ramp color, green. Okay? Yeah. Uh, here's the thing with green. You have your choice. Yeah, you can do whatever you want, <laughs> whatever pretty much. Want. Yeah. <laughs> so green has all of the staples when it comes to. And a lot of ramp. them are very cheap too. Yeah. Yeah. They've so, been in a bunch. So if you're going to go for a rampant growth or a three visits or a cultivate, Kadama's Reach, Nature's Lore, you can find them. They're everywhere. Seek, you know, Mana Dorks, um, Secure Tribe Elder. Yeah. Yep. 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 Even you know. just your Lanoir Elves type type of card. The thing about green is that those cards are very easy to get. Definitely consider them if you want to build out just because every time I build a green deck, DJ, I'm like choosing how many of these do I put in there? Mm -hmm. Do I put all of them? And then typically the answer is like almost yes. <laughs> so having a bunch of those around and it's not going to cost you very much at all to get four of each of these because again, they're very prominent now and they've been reprinted to death. 
Well, one thing that you might end up doing, and we actually suggest, is starting off with the cards that you have and then diversifying and picking and choosing the ones that fit with the deck. Right. For example, you might realize that your deck uh, is a little bit more creature based. Mm -hmm. You know, you have cards that synergize with creatures. You have like um, the Master. Great Henge or something the like Great that. Henge, yeah. that. That'll draw you a card when a creature enters the battlefield, but not when you Kadama's Reach. And right. so then you might, uh, after, this is down the road, you transition all of your ramp that's spell based to creature based, you know, or you might be running a different type of deck and you might realize that spells are a little bit better than those creatures. Yeah. And so you switch the other direction and that's part of the, the joy or the, the good part of having the staple binder is that it gets you to the point where you can try out the deck and learn these things yeah. and then tweak and change and make those decisions and refine those placeholder staples uh, down the road. Yep. One of the stables that we added here, though, that you don't see as often, I really like it, it's Migration Path. It's three and a green for a sorcery. You get to search your library for up to two basic land cards, put them on the battlefield, tap, then shuffle. But it has an additional text on it, which it says, Cycling 2. Pay two mana at any time, discard this card, draw a card. Why is cycling important? So I think that cycling is one of the most important things when you're building a deck because what it allows you to do is just get deeper into your action. And... That's good for winning a game of Commander. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? When you don't need to ramp and you need action to get one deeper. Great, great, solid thing for building Commander. But when you're brewing and your deck isn't quite uh, solidified, mm. you know, you might need to get to those cards that make the deck work and to try it out effectively. Yeah, you know, so you might not be trying and, to you, win the game. Yeah, you exactly. might be trying to get to that cool card that you wanted to test out or that strategy that you want to see. And so cards that are flexible that'll get you a little bit deeper to see that strategy, to see it work, to experience it, will make sure that that game serves its purpose. Yeah, so you may take Migration Path out of your deck. In fact, it may be one of the first cuts you yeah. do, but there will be times when you're very happy, when you're just testing out the deck, playing it for the first time, you need to hit the land drops or you just need to cycle it and find an answer answer in the moment so yeah. like that find the answer but also like experience the deck you know what i mean like yeah. you give it a try because a lot of times when you're playing a commander deck you don't see all your cards like most <laughs> of the time you don't see all your cards oh you see barely any of them really <laughs> exactly and so sometimes you have a deck that you're trying to make work right and you can play a game and only see staples. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or yeah. only see a part of the strategy. And so finding ways to make sure you get to experience the main strategy makes it so that you can continue refining it and continue deck building. All right. All right. Well, that covers green pretty extensively. You yeah. all already have heard these card names probably a thousand times now, now on the podcast. So let's talk about blue. So we've got two entries here for blue that could be uh, just very easy must have staples that you can put in almost any deck. Yeah, I think that Midnight Clock is a staple. Uh, two and a blue for an artifact. Uh, tap at a blue, and then you can pay two and a blue to put a hour counter on Midnight Clock. And at the beginning of each upkeep, you also put an hour counter on Midnight Clock. And then when there are 12 hour counters on it, you discard your hand, you shuffle everything together, you draw seven new cards. Pretty good. That's a so, whole new seven cards. Whole new seven. And it's just a three mana rock that taps for mana to begin with. So we know that, you know, we've bagged on this before because it's a little bit worse than the two mana rocks. But Midnight Clock comes with a whole extra benefit and it goes exactly to your point that you just made. You can dig further into your deck. Exactly. Like when you've already developed a little bit, then you see a brand new seven, which means that you'll be more likely to see what you need. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm down for that. Um, the next card here is a uh, tournament staple. It's Search for Ascanta. Yeah, this one's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit narrower, and, but I think that it's really good and we should pay attention to it. Search for yeah. Ascanta is one in the blue for a legendary enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, look at the top card of your library. You may put that card into your graveyard. Then if you have seven or more cards in your graveyard, you may transform Search for Ascanta. Yep, and on the other side, it's a land that taps for blue, but also you pay two in the blue and I think you look at the top seven or something well you look at some cards and you can find an instant resource or something like that yeah. who knows it doesn't matter yeah but the, the thing that does is, matter yeah. the front side is what we're talking about here. yeah because it, again it helps smooth out we're talking about smoothers later but it makes sure that you hit your land drops when you need yep. to and you can throw away cards and get closer to the cards that actually have your deck running but most importantly is that 
it's very slow ramp, but it is ramp because as soon as you play a couple spells, some creatures die, uh, you put some things in the graveyard, it will turn into a land. Right. And it flips over. So it's on like, it's like ramp, two mana ramp on suspend for like five turns. <laughs> <laughs> well, Shark Prince is not that good. Right. But <laughs> in, in so many decks, though, just because it gives you an effect, which is really important, which is it lets you basically scry in a way mm -hmm. at the beginning of each of your upkeeps. And getting further into your deck, again, very valuable, especially if you don't know if it works yet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so going into red mana ramp, it's a little bit... It's dicey. Yeah, it's dicey. So it's you've got, bad. you know, obviously you have, you know, mana geyser type effects where it's, you know, add mana for all the tap lands, but that's five mana. And also I think that you need a very m more specific deck, even though that card is amazing. Yeah, well, it's got know? two red pips in it, which is a, a difference maker. So instead we've got a really interesting card called Cursed Mirror. I'm a big fan of this card. Uh, you can tap it to add a red, and as Chris Mirror enters the battlefield, you may have it become a copy of any creature on the battlefield until end of turn, except it has haste. So it comes in and becomes a giant creature that has haste. You can ha Now, you don't have to do it, but it can copy it, attack with someone, you have value, but then it just becomes a very nice mana rock afterwards. Yeah, you can hit your opponent's stuff, but most importantly, hopefully you have a synergy that you're working on yourself, and Chris Mirror can help, like explode that synergy by doubling up something cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like Curse Mirror a lot. Again, red tip sort of has more like temporary ramp typically, so they don't have dedicated mana rocks. Um, you're typically playing all, if you're doing mono red, you're just playing every other mana rock you yeah. can. We'll lean more heavily on that arcane signet in the artifact section for sure. 100%. In red. Yeah, but I really like Curse Mirror because it just gets stuff done. You could double up on the end of the battlefield effect as well that you have, or mm -hmm. you're, what you're trying to do, you're getting another copy of that creature out. So it's got a lot of value there. And then red also has one of the best <laughs> ramp cards of all time. Sorry, bury the lead. It's Dockside Extortionist. Now, this card, not cheap, not easy to get. Even though they reprinted it recently, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, not, at least not a huge difference. But this is one of those cards that if you just happen to have a few of them, it will make your games go a lot better. Yeah, it's really good. I mean... It's hard, it's hard not to include it in a staple because it does something that red decks kind of struggle with. You know what yeah. I mean? We don't have a long list of great red mana producers uh, like we do with green. And so, I mean, it's, it's just so much more powerful than Cursed Mare. It's nuts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you play Doxa Extortionist, you may get an extra eight mana that turn, and then you really can do whatever you want. So, so you could almost get most of the card. Like, you could get a really solid start of a staple binder or a Dockside Extortionist. It's like... <laughs> yeah, the power level is absurd. So we do have to mention it just because it's that good of a card. Yeah. All right, next up is a new card from Baldur's Gate that has got a lot of people excited. We're moving into white now. White Ramp. Who would have thought that we had an answer for this? But we do. It's great. It's Deep Gnome Terramancer. One in a white for a creature, Gnome Wizard. It's got Flash, and it's got Mold Earth. Whenever one or more lands enter the battlefield under an opponent's control without being played... You may search your library for a planes card, put it on the battlefield tapped, then shuffle. Wow. Do this only once each turn. Wow. Woo. So you can get dual lands, shock lands that say planes on it. Uh, you also can flash this in in response to a fetch land. They're not going to see it come in. And it's not like White's typical catch-up mechanic where it's like, hey, how many lands do you have? I have less than you. Okay, cool. I get to do something. Now it's like, no, as long as a land enters the battlefield under your control and it wasn't played, well, White's going to love that now. Give me a land onto the battlefield, and it's you never see this. <laughs> so that's why it's so very important in white. Now, Deep, Ter Deep Gnome Terramancer is a little more expensive. I mean, it doesn't reach Dockside levels. It but doesn't it reach Dockside levels, obviously. But it is, I called it, I believe, the Dockside for white. So right now, Jimmy. Baldur's Gate is the closest. Uh, it's It's been released recently, so I think this is a card that you'd want to pick up sooner rather than later. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, we have to move on to another expensive mana ramp in white. This is what happens, though, right? White doesn't have natural. It's not like it's got green's abundant resources to ramp. So anytime a entry makes it onto this list, it's instantly going to get more valuable because it's one of none. Also, I feel like I'm including, well, the next card is Smothering Tithe. If you didn't guess it yeah. <laughs> already. <laughs> Smothering Tithe is a three and a white for an enchantment. Whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two. If the player doesn't, you create a colorless treasure artifact token with tap sacrifice. This artifact had one man of any color. One of the reasons why I chose these two cards uh, over something like Loyal Warhound mm -hmm. is that these actually fix your mana. They don't just get you a plane. They don't get you a basic plane. A, a basic plane. Yeah, yeah. Deep Known Terramancer gets you any planes, and so right. it could actually help 
fix you, which is one of the key components of mana ramp. Yep. And so these are kind of alone when it comes to actually ramping really efficiently and fixing. Yeah, I will say that Deep Gnome Terramancer is not going to trigger as many times as Smothering Tithe. So Smothering Tithe is just clearly the all-star here. But Smothering Tithe is like three times as expensive. It's not... Yeah. Gosh. Again, when you don't have many things to play with, the toys that you do get just become more valuable as a result. And don't, I would say very clearly, leave out some of these expensive cards on this ramp list and instead focus on those artifacts because those artifacts that we mentioned are cheaper. They will fix you. They will ramp you. Uh, And and there's so many other artifacts on the ones that we mentioned, by the way. You can just go online and look for just... There's tons of uh-huh. two mana, and that, that's when you can have the signets come in and all those talismans. Exactly. Even cards like Mirage Mirror, right? It's an artifact that can become a better artifact on the other side of the table. So there are lots of ways to do this without needing to go, well, I, they just told me to buy Dockside Extortion and Smothering Tide. What kind yeah, of commander I actually channel think, is this? Yeah, I actually <laughs> think that you, we have to mention it because they are staples and they would, they would work. Yeah. They would really work for the strategy that we're going to, but... I would, if you were starting off on this, not buy these and focus on all of the other components because all of the other ones will help you build decks and you yep. can get by with the artifacts. Yeah, and the artifacts, again, fit into any color. Um, I right. gave this speech and now we're going to talk about another expensive card. Yeah, well, now we're moving on to black. <laughs> and black's interesting because black's ramp cards are very focused on the fact that it is inside a black deck or wants to pump out black mana. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's not as flexible as the other colors because it just doesn't work that well with the other colors. Black cards also typically have the most mana pips after it that are the black mana symbol. Like, I just think of like Frexian Negator whenever Jeez, I... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like that kind of card you see very often in black. So as a result, a lot of the the ramp cards in black that are specific to black give you a lot of black pips which means that it's less flexible like you can't yep you can't really easily pair it with something else when your ramp is divided in half yeah so we have cabal coffers which is a land that gives you a black for each swamp you control you pay two and then crypt ghast which says whenever you tap a swamp for mana you add black to your mana pool now these both these effects very powerful right but very specific to decks that have a lot of swamps or are going to produce a lot of black mana. Exactly. And I wouldn't say that you need to invest heavily in these two cards unless you build a lot of black decks, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then you got Urborg and all that other stuff too. But Mm -hmm. if you don't want to be spending that much, focus on the, uh, the artifacts as always. Absolutely. Okay. So we talked a lot about mana, but I actually think that lands are a really nice transition from mana because you know, what lands are we fetching up? You know, how are we fixing our mana? Uh, And I think that there is one card that's uh, cheap enough that everyone needs to look at and pick up a copy of. Make sure that you have Fabled Passage in your collection. Yeah, this is as stapley as it gets in terms of new lands. Uh, This is basically a basic fetch land with a little caveat. So tap, sacrifice, Fabled Passage, search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. Then if you control four or more lands, untap that land. So the land you bring in could be the fourth one, uh, but it is basically saying find any basic and have it enter the battlefield untapped, as long as you're at four or more lands. And I think that this is fantastic because like, if you are playing Fabled Passage and you're worried about it entering the battlefield tapped, like, are you keeping starting hands with two or three lands in it? Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like maybe three lands, but then you're getting super unlucky not to draw the fourth one, the fourth by, one yeah. by that point in time. And so are you keeping two land hands, one of them Fabled Passage? Like, no, yeah, don't do you that. shouldn't keep two land hands. So unless you're going to play it on turn one and you have no other plays, right? Then, That's then another, the tapped is, uh, it doesn't okay. matter. Right. Yeah, yeah. So you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so I actually think that in almost every situation, Fabled Passage is an untapped fetch spectacular. Yeah, it's great, and there's a lot of the supply of that running around. And look, it only gets basic lands, but you get to do something, which is choose in the beginning of the game what land you're going to get based on the lands in your hand, based on what you're about to do with the, uh, you know, with the cards in your hand or, or with your commander. Yeah. So. Speaking of supply, there's a WFN promo, old border retro frame foil Ooh, out there. That's, that's right. Not, it's not that much more expensive than the baseline version. Yeah, because they gave them to a lot of stores. Exactly. Yeah, totally. And so sometimes if you're looking at your staples, cards that you're going to always have in a deck, if you're like, oh, the cool version's only 50 cents more, only a dollar more. Yeah, yeah. And there's a reason, by the way, that they made it a WPN promo is because they also recognize that this card's a staple and we should have more of them. Um, like Command Tower, which we won't mention because hopefully you also have Command Tower. Oh yeah, you should have Command Tower. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next staple that. is a bit more expensive, but it's, as you can tell, more powerful. It's Prismatic Vista. 
Pay one life, sacrifice Prismatic Vista, search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. So it's all the good stuff we said about the other one, you know? It's yep. all the good stuff. It's just another version of this. Helps fix you so well. It's a shame that it's like it's, five it's or six there. times more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> But again, if you're going to be able to grow your mana base, these two lands will fit into almost any single deck in the same way that the Artifact Ramp will as well. For sure. Um, okay, now there recently have been a series of lands called uh, Spell Lands that got released with uh, Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. And all of these lands, especially the first one we're going to mention, could be considered staples if, you have, if you're playing that color. In your They're such deck. staples because they replace... They're spells that replace lands, and so they are free. And so they give your deck more flexibility without diluting that cool strategy that you're exploring. Like, yep. that's it's that's perfect. Ex and exactly they enter the battlefield want. untapped. They're oh, just gosh. extremely powerful lands. So let's talk about the first one. It is Boseju, who endures. So all of them, again, they're legendary lands, and depending on the color, they en enter that way. So this one just enters, and you can tap it for a green, or you can channel it for one in the green, and that means you discard the land, and then you destroy target artifact, enchantment, or non-basic land and opponent controls. Sorry. Then a bunch of other texts they can sort of basically look their land, uh, search your library for a land with the same, uh, with a basic land type, and then put it on the battlefield, then shuffle. And th this effect actually costs one less if you have your commander out for each legendary creature you control. So you could just be so green, good. destroy an artifact or enchantment, and they get a land instead. I mean, it's so When good. do you it's not need that effect in commander? When you need a land drop, which yeah. is great. <laughs> yeah, then you just play the land. <laughs> but it's great it's because great. you can also have, let's say you have an opening hand with three lands and Bosage is one of them. Because it doesn't enter the battlefield tapped, you don't need to play it on turn one. You can wait till turn five, maybe. Maybe you've drawn other lands. And then you look around the table and go, okay, nothing cool to blow up. I am just going to play this land now. I don't care about the secondary effect. Exactly. The fact that you can sandbag it to see if it were like to, to make uh, sure yeah. you hit your land drop and it doesn't enter battlefield tapped. It's insane. Yeah. The other legendary lands from this cycle that we'll talk about are all of them, but the white one, it's Oduwara Soaring City, Takanuma Abandoned Mire, and Sokenzen Crucible of, not worlds, Crucible of uh, uh, Defiance. All of them have a different channel ability. All of them have that same clause where if you have a, it costs one less for each legendary creature you control. And they're all just really useful. Yeah, we you got bounce, bring a creature back, uh, create little dudes. Yeah, pretty nice. Uh, all very useful. And again, if you just have one of these, you're building on a mana base and you go, oh, you know what? I'm going to take one island out for Odawara. You're in plenty fine shape. You're great. You're yeah, great. You're not going to be hurting your deck. If anything, you'll be powering it up without diluting it or taking away from the theme that you're building. That's why lands are so important. Okay, so we talked a little bit about fixing when it came to Prismatic Vista and um, Fabled Passage and Command Tower. Uh, so how else do we have, like, what other tools do we have to fix? Because, you know, it'd be nice for us to, in our deck building to have access to all the fetches, all the duels. It every would be single nice. Land. Yeah, like, that would help us tinker and that would help us build, right? Yeah, but obviously that's not the case. We can't have that because it's really expensive. And yeah. to actually do all that, you need to buy all the fetches and all the shock lands and all that stuff. And then you're just looking at the similar situation we talked about earlier, which is you may not be able to actually play it. So let's talk about if you had a mono blue card, how many decks could you play this in? Uh, okay, so if you got a mono blue card, you could play it in a blue deck. Yep. Azorius, Demir, Is it Simic, Grixis, Esper, Bant, Teamer. Teamer. Yeah, that's like four 11, cards. I think. Or... Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I might even be missing one. Yeah, five color, four color. <laughs> five, exactly. So those are a lot of decks that you could play a blue card in. But if you have a blue black card or a blue black land, how many things do we fit in there? Demir. The mirror. That's it. Like that's it for the two colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then for three colors, there's Esper and Grixis. Yeah, three. Because Bant and Teamer won't work. Yeah. Right. And we just talked about nine, ten, eleven version uh, color combinations that work for just the blue cards. That's so. the same logic we used for multicolored spells, like the Assassin's Trophy at yep. the top of the show. And so la these lands, being two colors, are way less flexible. So it really stinks that we're spending a lot of money on these lands. Like if we invest in fetches and duels and they're definitively fitting in fewer decks. Yeah. Now, again, if you already have them, great. They're in your collection. But if you're looking to build out this staple base, don't go for those first, right? Think about what you're going to be able to play in more things. Unless, again, you're just the person that only plays Demir decks. Then, yeah, buy that watery grave. Yeah. But I think that's when you, you, you've you built the staple binder. You have a Demir deck, and you're like, I love this deck. Then you just buy the watery grave. Yeah, yeah. That's part of the upgrade yeah, process. Yeah, you don't need to buy 10 watery graves in case you build 10 exactly. decks. Exactly. Or or just immediately get the watery grave in case you build the Demir. Like, that doesn't make sense. Right. Yeah, um, good point. So, 
if you are looking at filling out your mana base, I would spend your money on things that enter the battlefield untapped. Yeah. And the reason why is because I think that there are a lot of really cool and interesting utility and fixing that enter the battlefield tapped. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're pretty good. Like I think that the, the creature lands, you know, right. they're, they're really cool. You know, I like them. I like them a lot, but they're usually pretty inexpensive and you can find a lot of fixing and cool utility, but they enter the battlefield tapped. And so if you're fixing that you spend money on enters the battlefield tapped and your cool, cheap, uh, right. you know, utility also enters the battlefield tapped. Then all your lands enter the battlefield tapped. Uh, not good. Then what you're doing is you're slowing your whole deck down by probably a turn. Full turn, yeah. And that means that you're not going to experience your deck working the way that it should. So let's talk about some of the cards that should you want to go down this route, what your sort of thinking would be. So the shocks and the fetches are sort of the main ones that come to mind in terms of, all right, they can all under the battlefield untapped. They can help fix my mana, and it seems like they were kind of recently reprinted or given to us again in a set. The fetches are, some of them are at an all-time low. Yeah, so Modern Horizons 2 was a set that was massively open, tons and tons of cards there for Commander players. And then the shocks, we've seen them reprinted in Secret Layers recently, but most recently in Ravnica. They're coming out in the un... They're going to be That's right, they will be in, in Unfinity as in well. In Unfinity, Yeah, so. so the shocks seem like they actually come back pretty often. So again, pay attention. When the shocks are announced, you're going to watch that price dip, and those are moments to buy into that. Modern Horizons 2 is another great moment to look at Fetchland. So if you're going to be investing, pay attention to the market, pay attention to what sets are coming out, and the reprints, and that's going to help a lot. So make sure you're not wasting money. I don't think they're going to be cheap in Unfinity, though. I think they're going to be really yeah, expensive. Yeah, well, because they look... Pretty look cool. cool. They look really cool. <laughs> uh, but also, one thing that you might want to target is sometimes they uh, put a single good land in a commander deck. Right. Uh, they've done this with the pain lands. You know, they put out one pain land in this commander deck, and now the pain lands that used to be like five dollars have dropped down to fifty cents. Yeah, something yeah, like that. Yeah. And so, a lot of the pain lands are something that you can definitely target. Yeah, Battleborn. Also, those lands seem to be pretty low because they were reprinted. They were just reprinted too. Gate. So yeah, like Bountiful Promenade, Luxury Suite. These are uh, these care if you have two or more opponents. So. You're playing commander, pretty good. Fixing your lands. Okay, so we're not giving you definitive advice on what things to buy, but it's more about like when opportunities present themselves, pay attention to them. Pay attention and know yeah. why you want to buy it instead of just going, oh, I'm FOMOing, I don't know, should I get this or not? Uh, I feel the pressure. And then making a decision that you're going to regret. And there's nothing wrong with basics. Oh basics gosh. are great. Yeah. If you, <laughs> In fact, you could just be like the guy that just it's great. Like DJ just buys cool basics with cool foiling on them too, you know? Oh that, yeah. That's a way to, that, oh, yeah. not that cheap to do that, but there's plenty <laughs> of basics out there. There are plenty of basics that look really good too. And so if you're going to add your style to your deck, go all in on those basics and basics are fantastic. They you don't are. need that much. You do not always need perfect fixing all the time. Yeah. Sometimes you just need the basics. Uh, let's talk about one final type of land here because I think this is when I first saw them, I was like, I'm instantly getting as many of these as I can because I'm pretty sure that if I'm playing this color of the deck, it's going to be very hard for me not to put this in there. Jimmy, I got 10 of each of these. Nice. Did you, did you do about I got, same? yeah, I got four of each of them. Yeah. I just like the play set feel. So these are MDFCs or modal dual faced cards. So the coolest thing anyone's ever said in Magic the Gathering. Uh, so these are lands... <laughs> that allow you to play the, if, if you play their front side, they're a spell, and on the back side, they're a land. And typically, they're lands that enter the battlefield tapped, or they're special lands they have to pay three life uh, that then can enter untapped. But on the back side, that's the land. On the front side is what's interesting, because you're going to love these cards. They're so flexible. They take a land spot, but they don't take away from a spell slot. Exactly. Similarly to those Kamigawa lands that we talked about, they yeah. give you this extra flexibility, where you don't have to worry about having this effect in your deck and taking up, taking away from your synergy, your strategy, the cool thing that you're building. Yep. You just have it in place of a land. Yeah, so, so I love this first one. We've talked about this a ton on the show now. Yeah, Balaged Recovery is two and a green for a sorcery. Return target card from your graveyard to your hand. Yeah, or on the backside, a to enters the battlefield taps land that taps for green. Great. So great, so great. Late game, you draw this, you're happy as heck. If it was just a basic land, not so happy. But now you can pay three mana, grab something back, and maybe get yourself back in the game. Early game, you were like, you know what? I just need to hit my land drop. I'm gonna play this, not discard it like a dummy would on game nights like me. I also think that recursion <laughs> naturally is really good when you're brewing because if you are trying a strategy, you got your cool thing out, people are like, oh, that thing is cool. You got uh, an ending yeah. one. I'm gonna kill that. 
and then you're like, oh, I didn't, really, I didn't really feel like it was going. You know what I mean? Right. Get it back again so that you can see your cool engine work. Same goes for this next one, uh, Malakir Rebirth. It's black for an instant. Choose target creature. You, get, you lose two life until end of turn. That creature gains. When this creature dies, return to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control. Your commander. Someone's trying to get rid of your combo piece creature that's helping you draw through. Whatever it is, instead of a land, you got Malakir Rebirth. So good. And if it needs to be a land, it's a land. I love it. I love it. Uh, Hagra Mauling is a removal spell. Shatter Skull Smashing is a damage-based spell in red. And that's one of those lands that you can pay three life on the other side to have it enter the battlefield untapped. I'm really big on Shatter Skull Smashing. It's a game. It's it also could just kind of help you win the game at the end of the game by getting rid of some blockers or whatever. Yeah, it's great. You want to have that interaction, but you don't want to dilute your deck with it. So make sure you have some interaction and having them on a lands is fantastic. Yeah. Um, I think that this next one is spectacular. It's Turn Timber Symbiosis. Yeah, this is a classic green effect. And the fact that you can have it stapled onto a land and green decks love doing this kind of thing. I love this card. So it's a sorcery. Look at the top seven cards of your library. You may put a creature card from among them on the battlefield. If that card has mana value three or less, it enters with three additional plus one plus one counters on it. And the rest go on your bottom of your library in a random order. Or just play it as land. Play it as land. Play it untapped. Take that three damage. All right, so we've talked about now artifacts, some lands, and some very, very good staples for a lot ramp. of lands, a lot, a of, lot of a land. lot of like development stuff. But turns out you play lands in every deck. Yeah. That's just a guaranteed thing you got to put into all of the, your decks. Uh, but when we come back from this mid break, we got a lot left, including one of my favorite categories ever called smoothers. Smooth. So to find out what that's all about, stick around. We'll be right back. And I pass the turn. Ugh, my hand is full of gas. It's just so expensive. Oh, I know. Gas is super expensive these days. My mana curve's pretty low. I'm just- Tired of overpaying at the pump? Trust me, I know how you feel. Do you? Luckily, there's a great way to get cash back whenever you pay for gas, groceries, or dining out. And that's Upside. Just this morning, I was refilling the tank, so I booted up the app, claimed an offer, and checked in at the gas station. Then Upside gave me money for the gas I was already buying. That is pretty cool, but as far as the game... Oh, with Upside, there are no games. It's as good as it sounds, and super easy to use. Plus, I'm getting way more cash back than I ever did from credit card rewards or loyalty programs. In fact, I got enough to play some drafts at my LGS. To get started, just download the free Upside app, use our promo code COMMAND, and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Nice, so can I take my turn now? Sure. Mm, I pass. Download the free Upside app and use promo code COMMAND to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using promo code COMMAND. Hello, I'm Dryad of the Elysian Grove, here to talk to you about Me Undies, the comfortable underwear company that's taking the internet by storm. Now me, I never wear underwear. I like to feel the breeze on my vines. But when the open air gets nippy, I snuggle up with Me Undies' collection of clothes and accessories. That's right, Me Undies makes more than just underwear. They've got durable, cushy socks that make my feet sing. Just call me Dryad of the Elysian Grove, baby. Plus, they're super stretchy loungewear. Daily tees, shorts, and even rompers to add some silky softness to every phase of the day. Look, I even got this Catwoman hoodie for my dog. <laughs> like a tree, his bark is worse than his bite. Because trees don't bite, unless you ask nicely. Wink. And everything's available in sizes extra small through 4XL with tons of prints and more colors than I let your lands produce. So make like a me and leaf discomfort behind with soft and sustainable me undies. MeUndies has a great offer for fans of the Command Zone. For any first-time purchasers, you get 20% off plus free shipping and returns. To get 20% off your first order, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, go to MeUndies.com slash command. Again, that's MeUndies.com slash command. Okay, and then I do that. Oh, oh no. I've been goldfishing for so long, I don't have time for dinner. That's a Factor Fiction. Factor Fiction. Uh, no, that's a mole drifter. Not your card, silly. The idea that you don't have time for dinner is a fiction, thanks to Factor, the service that delivers chef-crafted meals ready to eat in just two minutes. Factor meals arrive at your door fully pre-prepared. No cooking, no cleanup, it's even faster than takeout. Factor makes it easy to eat well for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and everything in between, with fresh, never-frozen meals that are so delicious you won't believe they're actually nutritious. They offer 32 different dishes every week, including their 
new Gourmet Plus meals alongside Calorie Smart and Keto options to help get fit for summer. And there's no risk factor here. You can always change your plan to fit your schedule. Here, try this potato leek mash and grilled chicken that was heating up while I was talking. Wow, this is delicious. And that's a factor fact. Head to go.factor75.com slash command130 and use code command130 to get $130 off across six boxes. That's code command130 at go.factor75.com slash command130 for $130 off. All right, we're back. We're talking about the must-have cards for your commander collection, how to be the cool kid at school when you go and someone's like, hey, I want to build a commander deck. And you're like, ha ha. I got exactly what you need and more. I mean, everyone at the local game store is going to be like, oh man, I'm really thinking about brewing this deck. And you're like, I've made it. Yeah, I have made it. And it (laughs) took me five minutes. I didn't need to buy a single card to do so because I have these must have cards in my binder. And this next one is actually one that I need to flesh out for my own collection. Mm -hmm. You called them smoothers. And I love that name. Uh, And let's make it official now. These cards are smoothers. Okay. I am a big proponent of this effect called smoothers. What they do is they, make sure that you draw lands when you need to draw lands and you draw spells when you need to draw spells. Right. They're small, simple, easy to cast effects that make sure that your curve is smooth, that your play is smooth, that your land drops are smooth, that everything smooths out so that you have a nice and even game. And this cannot be overlooked because a lot of times, you know, we don't have the land drop that we need and Mm -hmm. our whole game suffers from it. Oh, I know. Or we flood out in the late game and we feel like there's nothing we can do because we've just flooded out. Yeah. So I love these cards as well. I've started to play them in any deck I brew for the first time. If I go, oh, you know, I need to buy, I need to get these 10 things. I go, what about 10 smoothers instead? And you cannot go wrong because these are kind of like cheap cantrippy effects. They're going to replace themselves, but they're going to give you a little extra value. So you're going to hit those land drops when you need them. That's extra selection. I think it's critical to be able to use it to hit a land drop or use it to get past a land drop to a spell. Exactly. Or get to your strategy. That's another thing that helps out a lot is that if you're trying to do a thing, smoothers help you get to that thing. Yeah, so we have got cards like Ponder or Preordain. Preordain is blue for a sorcery. Scry two, then draw a card. Playing this on turn one, if you're keeping a hand that you're like, "Ah, you know, I have four lands in this hand, but you know what? I've got to ponder turn one. Ponder, scry two, see two lands, bottom it. You you feel so much better about that game because you were able to keep a hand with lands and fix your draw for the next two turns. Absolutely. Um, Going up to, by the way, I think that the best ones of these are one mana, but you can get some at two mana. So like something like Charter Course. uh, One in a blue for a sorcery, draw two cards, then discard a card unless you attacked with a creature this turn. Really good with graveyard decks if you're just okay drawing a two and then discarding one, but there's a good chance you're attacking two and you don't need to discard at all. Yeah, sometimes this gives you just a tiny bit of selection to, you know, get what you need. And then if you need to get rid of just a gigantic eight drop, you can pitch that or you can pitch the extra land yep and here's the thing it's not just blue that gets these effects green has a bunch of green has great ones yeah adventurous impulse green mana for a sorcery look at the top three cards of your library you may reveal a creature or land card from among them and put it into your hand so again turn one turn two even turn three need that land drop you're looking at three more cards it could be a creature or a land so so very powerful See, this does only work in creature-based decks, though. So let's say that you have like a green-blue spells deck kind of thing. Right. And you're looking to hit your ramp or something like that. This is only hitting a creature, so maybe it's a little bit more narrow. I do like Abundant Harvest. It's also a single green mana. Ooh. Choose land or non-land. That's the key, like land or oh, land. Oh, yeah. So you yeah. got creatures, artifacts, instant sorcery, exactly. enchantments. Yeah. Uh, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a card of the chosen kind. Put that card in your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Wow, that's this, great. Like, this is the definition of a smoother where it's like, okay, I just need a land or I need anything but a land. Yeah, it's kind of similar to Winding Way that says choose creature or land and you're only doing the top four cards. But so Abundant Harvest, I think is really shining through here. Yeah, but I mean, Winding Way could draw you more than one card. Like you can say land and draw oh, four lands. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have even, if you have a way to even put cards back on, you brainstorm or something. Yeah, that's kind of cool too. There's a lot. Little... And actually like, uh, I feel like my decks are approximately 50% land. So Winding Way, naming land <laughs> can draw you two, two land cards. Yeah, so two, a lot of two the time. Two is a very good rate. Yeah. Um, Red's got their sort of a hat in the 
bowl, hat in the pen, hat in the what is this? They've they've thrown their hat hat in the ring. Throwing their hat in the ring. Yeah, their hat is also in the ring or something like that. They're typically a little bit more about impulsive draw, so like thrill of possibility, or you're discarding, right? Yeah. Throw possibility one in a red instant as an additional cost to cast a spell. Discard a card. Draw two cards. Red's got a lot of graver synergies. You're discarding anger or whatever. Uh, You also have like reckless impulse. And this is much more common, I think, in red these days. One, a red sorcery. Exile the top two cards of your library. Until the end of your next turn, you may play those cards. So you essentially draw two cards that have to get played before the end of your next turn, but you can play a land and then whatever that other card may be. These are much better when you're trying to hit your land drops because odds are you will hit one, you'll hit your next land drop, and everything will be fine. Yeah. They're... It's it's a little bit more difficult when you're looking for action because sometimes your action won't line up with when you're playing this. Yeah, You'd rather have it drop. in your hand. You're like, exactly. oh, crap. Yeah, so it's not quite as good as some of these other colors, Just, but it is good for hitting your land drops, and so we're going to include it here. Mm-hmm. I like it a lot. Uh, March of Reckless Joy is a new one from Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. It's got too much text on it, but just know that it is a powerful, similar spell to Reckless Impulse where you can exile cards until your next end of your next turn to play them. And there's nothing in white. Literally, there's nothing in white. Yeah. Well, there. Yeah. So white may have like a cantrip, but that's not the same as. But it doesn't give you scry plus draw card. It doesn't help you. Like it can. By the way, there aren't even very many one drop cantrips. Yeah. There's like defiant strike and like you know random stuff like that. There's only like there's only like five of them anyways, and a lot of them just prevent one damage or give something plus one plus o. It's 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 not enough. Yeah. And it do, what it doesn't do critically is give you some little tiny bit of selection. That's what you need because you need to be able to either get to the land or get past the land. Yeah, and it, giving yep. you no selection means that you're you're out. Like there's no there's no way around it. You're out. Fortunately, you got artifacts though. In what yeah. you could just play treasure map instead. Great card. Uh, you could also play Maze Mind Tome. I'm really high on this card recently. I've I've seen it do so much work because it just comes down and instantly starts to do something. Absolutely. Both of these are a little bit clunkier than I usually like in a smoother because Treasure Map is two mana and then one to activate. And so you might have a hard time fitting this into your normal curve, but it still has a pretty big effect. And mm-hmm. once it flips and creates those three treasures... That's legitimate card draw, and it's a huge boost of mana. That's like four yep. mana after you flip it. Yeah, it and takes so that a can while, be pretty powerful. But it's really powerful, yeah. yeah. And Maze Mind Tome, you can just tap it to scry one. You're putting tome counters on it. And then when there's four more tome counters on it, you get rid of the Maze Mind Tome. But you also have the option to draw cards with it as well. Yeah, so red and white decks, I think that you can lean a little bit heavier on these artifacts. Yep, totally. Okay, so those are smoothers. Um, obviously, your brain is not smooth if you're playing these. It's very complex because these are great cards for your deck. And I think they're great cards for just right now in your commander decks. Like, and if oh, you find yeah. that if you find that like maybe you're playing 38 lands, take a land out and put in a smoother. Because oh, that, that card sure. can help you get to a land if you need to. But it also gives you more flexibility late game when you just need to keep churning through your deck and not draw a land in, in the place of that. Exactly. Yeah, I actually built a Miram deck recently, sent in a worm, and that card is six mana to get out, and there are a lot of big dragons in there. And the last thing you want to do is draw an opening hand where you've got five, seven drops. Mm-hmm. So it, smoothers are so important because they allow you to make sure that you're not you're drawing what you need. You're looking for the ramp or the cards or whatever it is. So I play Perfect. every ponder effect I can in that deck. Nice. All right, let's just talk about raw card draw. Okay. Rhymed. Let's start off in green. Uh, We're looking for uh, either a system to generate us multiple cards across the game, or we're looking for raw card draw in usually two or more, hopefully a little bit more than that. Yep. So in green, we've got... Starting off with the expensive one, Sylvan Library. Yep, this is great. You can draw up to three cards at the beginning of your turn. You take eight life uh, total for that, but... That's a huge advantage. So good. It also huge advantage. it comes like, out early as well as one. This is a built-in smoother too, which is why we kind of transitioned using it because nice. it can help align. Even if you never pay any life, you should be paying life. You should be paying but that e- life. <laughs> but even if you never do, you can line up your draws effectively so yeah. that you can be drawing what you need to. Yep. Um, it's expensive though. It is expensive. It's seen some reprints. We've saw it in Commander Collection Green and sometimes the Master Set. So just keep an eye out for it. it. There will be a point, I'm sure, in the future when it gets reprinted, it's a good choice and time to buy in. And that would be, you know, just keep an eye out because every green deck has a could be playing this card. <laughs> uh, next up, we have Tireless Tracker. It's a little Classic. bit slow getting going, but I like the ability to uh, store up your card draw. Tireless Tracker is two and a green for a 3-2 human scout. Whenever a land enters the battlefield, uh, you create a clue. 
You can crack clues for two mana, sacrifice that clue, draw a card. Tireless Tracker also gets bigger when you sacrifice those clues. Yep. Um, the so thing, you, yeah, like you said, you can just store them. You don't have to do it all at once. That's what I like, because it's very mana inefficient. If you're thinking about, oh, I'm paying five mana and a land drop to draw a single card. Yeah. No. Not yeah, great. Not, not great there, but I like the ability to, to curve out, play your game plan, and then have these this card draw stored up later for when you can fit it naturally into yeah, your Yeah, you've got now eight mana available, and your hand has one card in it. Well, great end step, crack two clues, draw two more cards. If I'm your opponent, I'm sweating, because that is something that I was not seeing uh, coming, and I was like, you know what, clues, are they suck. Two mana per... But when you get to that late game and everyone's just trying to find something off the top of their deck, they get they get way more valuable, and it's hard to underestimate that. Green does have some great card draw, so there are definitely more options than we mentioned. I think we have to mention the classic Harmonize. Two green green for sorcery, draw three cards. Yeah, so let's talk about like rates, right? Anytime that you're paying one mana for one card, that is considered a good rate. Uh, Harmonize is four mana for three cards, but that's still considered a good rate because you're almost getting one mana per card. Sylvan Library could be two mana and eight life for three cards over and over and over again. So that's why it's so powerful. Sometimes a very average rate is uh, two mana for a card. And sometimes uh, wizards tax that on to certain mm -hmm. effects. Like we've seen... Clues. <laughs> yeah, we've seen... Cl exactly. Clues is an example. Sometimes in, in Limited, we see uh, bears for four mana that have draw card right. attached to it. Right. Uh, and so they... Right, they'll add that to the mana value. Exactly. Right, right, right. But usually in Commander, that's not something that we're excited about. And so we get excited if we can tack on a single mana to draw card. That's usually pretty good very good you know uh, but if it's you know two mana then it better be adding something else or be something like tireless tracker where we can do it over and over and over again at our leisure yeah or it synergizes so well with your deck because of the extra ability but yeah that's typically how watsi balances the cards in design is they'll add a little bit another pip another colorless mm -hmm. man to its cost or sorry generic man to its cost and that allows it to then have flying or have haste or whatever that extra ability is mm -hmm. Uh, all right, let's move on to blue. Classic blue card, Windfall. Two in the blue, each player discards their hand, then draws cards equal to the greatest number of cards a player discards this way. Blue, you have your choice again, and you have a lot of really inexpensive cards that so draw a lot. You yeah. know, you have tons of choice. It's almost like you're ramping green. Uh, I chose Windfall for this category because it's inexpensive, and also it fulfills the role of that big draw. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's not mm -hmm. a smoother. It's not drawing you two or three or something like that. A lot of times this just gets you a brand new six or seven or Sometimes even more. more. Yeah, Someone's exactly. Got, so the person with 20 cards in their hand goes, ah, oh, shucks. Everyone's about to draw 20 cards. Exactly. And if you are uh, trying to try out a new strategy and you're looking to get as many looks at a card as you need to, to find your strategy to get things going, then Windfall will get you the most looks. Yep, totally. Uh, similarly, we have Factor Fiction, uh, three and a blue for an instant. Uh, basically, you reveal the top five cards. A friend of yours gets to divide them into two piles, and then you get to pick whichever pile is best. Definitely pick the friend because they're going to give you a better selection. Do not pick the enemy. Exactly. Again, <laughs> this gets you pretty deep. Five cards deep is really, really good. And I actually actually just think it's one of the most fun commander cards out there it engages with friends like you yeah you're, you're doing things together sometimes everyone's like no do this do that no no do this or sometimes you're craig and you give them the whole stack <laughs> yes. don't do that uh you these next that. two cards are also really powerful they are both using the delve mechanic which means you can exile cards from your graveyard while casting the spell and it pays for one of the mana so you got dig through time which is six blue blue and treasure cruise which is seven and a blue I like Dig Through Time because, again, you might be looking for something specific in a deck that's not optimized. And yep. so being able to go deeper to find that interaction that, you know, so you, you can didn't deck, have yeah. enough of it. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so sometimes when you have a deck that isn't fully tuned, you might need a little bit more reach to figure things out. Yeah. Treasure Cruise is uh, just drawing three cards. Dig Through Time, you're looking at the top seven cards and you're picking two of them and putting them into your hand. So a lot more selection there. I will say these cards get better if you're playing ramp that is like rampant growth and three visits as opposed to specifically artifact based ramp because you're filling up your graveyard mm -hmm. early game and you're going to need to use a card like windfall or treasure cruise to fill up at that crucial moment search to keep going oh yeah search for us canta yeah great great callback there all right in red we are a little bit short yeah now, of there's, course there's that there's that impulse draw yeah but impulse draw isn't really getting us what we want to in this big strategy like i would call the impulse draw smoothing right because you only have it for a turn and that's the turn you need it to help give you over that hurdle it's not so you can draw those cards and hold it for the late game like you're saying here yeah uh it doesn't give you that that raw influx of cards that you that you that give you more options impulse draw gives you that one option right now 
Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and it's limited, and it goes away forever if you don't play it. So I'd say the closest red gets are card parity. So cards like Cathartic Reunion, where you're discarding cards to draw cards. This does get you pretty deep. Three cards is a lot. It is a lot. But, but it's nothing compared to these other effects that we're talking about. Yeah, and really the big whammy in red is a very expensive staple. Uh, it is Wheel of Fortune. Oh, all the money. I mean... Is there, Jimmy, is there something else we can... Wheel have? of Misfortune! It's the closest approximation to Wheel of Fortune. It causes a lot more head scratching and yawns and groans at the table. But it is a way to have the same effect happen. It is and, definitely narrower because uh, it works best in decks that pressure opponent's life total. Yeah, You know what sure. I mean? Yeah. And red decks often do, but you know, you might have a Grixis deck or some other red deck that that's meant to dirtle or that isn't pressuring people's life total. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Totally. Um, yeah. Let's so put Wheel of Misfortune, not, not, not Wheel of Fortune. Yeah. Much, Wheel of Misfortune is the, the closest. And honestly, we have, I forgot which episode it was. We spent like 20 minutes talking about how to play it correctly. Um, but there's a <laughs> lot, I, there's like articles and stuff out there too, because it's a confusing card. So you know, I just want to make sure you read up on that before you jam it at your table. Ultimately card draw is best when it's cheapest because yeah. then you can use those cards. You know, you're not just spending your entire turn to then change up your cards so that you can play next turn. And so if you're paying, you know, five mana for a wheel, that's great and all, mm -hmm. but your ability to impact the board and use those cards after the wheel is definitely minimized. So yep. the cheaper things are, the better. That's why those delve spells are particularly good. Yeah, I love those a lot. Okay, let's move on to white. White's not got too many. Uh, a new addition to the family, though, Welcoming Vampire. We, we'd like to welcome you in. I do like that. And it's not too expensive. I thought it was going to be really expensive and it turned out to be okay. Yeah, not bad at all. So it's flying whenever one or more creatures with power two or less enter the battlefield under your control draw a card and this ability triggers only once each turn i like this more than mentor of the meek even though mentor oh, of the meek yeah, got a reprint totally. it's very very cheap so you can pick one of those up uh, but that has that one man attacks on it and it really prevents me from uh playing what i want to during the turn yeah it adds up um Welcoming vampire is narrow though you need small creatures and we're talking about a staple binder that like works with building any deck are you going to have a critical mass of small creatures? I don't know. So this might not even fulfill the goal of this exercise. But it is a good card in the decks that do want it for the weenie decks and all that stuff. Now, there is a mechanic called Monarch, and actually every color has the ability to put Monarch on the table. Yeah, maybe um, we should have been mentioning Monarch all, all up until here, but yeah, this is fantastic. But I would say for white and red specifically, it's the two most important colors, again, because they're the least successful when it comes to card draw. Mm -hmm. So white has Court of Grace and Palace Jailer. They both give Monarch... Those are the top tier ones. I love those them are the so top much. tier ones are very, very good. But here's the thing. When you have Monarch, you are also creating the dynamic that everyone else wants Monarch. So and you have that enough, in mind. Yeah. And do you have enough creatures to retake the Monarch? Or do you have a strategy that will help will help with that to make sure that you have the ability to regain the Monarch at least some of the time to yeah. actually count it as card draw? Yep. So again, Monarch is narrow. It's just narrow. It's narrow. It'll, it'll definitely give you that extra card the turn you get it. But from that point on, unless you're ready to defend yourself against yeah. attackers, it's no holds barred. Everyone that's wants that the, card. That's not the engine that we, we we're trying to get no. as, uh, through this category. Yeah, but white and red, obviously, as always, sort of the lowest on the uh, the quality list when it comes to card draw. Well, let's come back around to black because I think that they definitely have some solid card draw. Oh, yeah. I am a big fan of two mana card draw like Knight's Whisper and Sign and Blood. Great cards. Just, just gets you a little bit deeper. Um kind of feel like uh, smoothers a little bit because they just get you a, one extra card deeper. Fantastic. Yeah, Knight's Whisper is a card you see played a lot in CEDH, so you know that the rate and the power of this card is very high up there. Just two mana, draw two cards, lose two life. Very much normal stuff, but one card gets you two, so there's card advantage there. Uh, and Sign and Blood is, you know, target player draws two cards and lose two life, so yeah. a similar thing. If you want to get a little bit deeper, have a little bit more selection, I'm a big fan of Read the Bones. I love two reading those bones. They're so good. Two and a black for a sorcery. Scry two, draw two, lose two. Right. But that has you seeing, like, if you really are looking for something, that's four cards deep. If you scry two to the bottom and then draw two more cards. Yeah. I mean, that gets you what you're looking for. Yep. I love Breed the Bones. I think if you're playing in a deck that's primarily black and don't have access to your ponders and preordains, Knight's Whisper, Read the Bones, those are almost auto-includes, especially as you're just starting out with the deck. All right, let's talk about some big card draw in black. <laughs> Because uh, yeah. we this don't really is... have this in other categories. But... So yeah, <laughs> black does have some X black black draw. Those cards lose that much life. But the uh -huh. big daddy in terms of how powerful it is is probably Bolas's Citadel. Ooh. 
So you're allowed to look at the top card you library at any time. You can play the top card you library, including land. If you cast a spell this way, you lose life equal to the card's mana value. And then randomly, you can tap it to sacrifice 10 non-land permanents, and uh, each opponent loses 10 life. But you, I've never seen that happen once, by the oh, way. Oh, you haven't? I've no. done that a bunch of times. Oh, nice, before. nice. It's great, yeah. Um, but it might be just based on your deck, if you have little, right. little dumpy things all around. Yeah. Um, Bolus of Citadel might not fit with all of the other card draw spells that we have in here, but gosh, it's so good. It's, it's so, so fun. Good. It's not that much money. Yeah, it, got, it was released it got, in a store promo, right? Yeah, it was a store promo, and it was a, another promo, too. So there's the original printing and two promo printings of it. Yeah, card is really good. Obviously, three black, black, black to cast Very it. black, yes. So yes, you're yes. going to need to have a deck that can handle that. But this card, I've seen it just completely turn the tables uh, because of someone was behind, and all of a sudden, they just got to churn through six cards in their deck and play all this stuff stuff and they have the life total because we're in commander so good you know if we're including bolus of citadel let's just say that future sites a cool thing for blue and then <laughs> there you go like, sure. and it'll be balanced out yeah 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 no, yeah, I don't know. yeah. <laughs> just blue, so fun i had to throw it into the card look, draw blue and black don't need that much help with card draw exactly. as you can tell you could just play knight's whisper and be so happy okay okay the next category is tutors ah tutoring so Look, there's a lot of negative uh, just stancing towards tutors because it's, you know, ah, you're, it's cheating or ah, it's too powerful. Ah. It goes against, they're like, you're playing a hundred card singleton. That's the spirit of the game. Yeah, your By tutors, tutors less than a hundred cards. Exactly. Like you are, you are going against the spirit of commander by reducing the variance in your deck. Do, do you think there's validity to that argument? I think everyone's definition of the spirit of the commander is probably going to be different to, for Call. starters. Uh, but Different people are different. Different play groups are different. Yeah, you can't say that the person saying it is wrong, and you can't say that you saying it is necessarily right either. Uh, but tutors are still very important if you want to smooth out what you're doing and make sure you have the answers when necessary. Because it sucks when you're like, oh, darn, if I just had a tutor in this case, I could not die. <laughs> and I would be able to keep playing the game. And or, again, like we're talking about decks that you might be starting to build that might not be optimized. You yeah, know? totally. And if you haven't, if you haven't gone through and optimized everything and made everything perfect and everything tuned together, then you might need a little bit of help getting there. Totally. And tutors are that help. Like they get you that other card that you need, or maybe you haven't even bought everything yet. You're like, okay, I'm going to try out this deck, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not going to buy the expensive cards. I'm going to just buy the core of this deck, Yep. you know, and then the tutor will get you that one piece that you need. Whereas if you do love the deck, you might take the tutor out and buy that expensive piece of redundancy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or just keep the tutor in. So let's talk about some of the tutors here. Uh, Black has Demonic Tutor. It's expensive. It's the yeah, classic. It's you can find any card in your deck for just one in the black at sorcery speed. But there's also the budget alternative of Sidisi Undead Vizier. Vizier? Vizier? <laughs> there's also other kinds of uh, tutors that are not Demonic Tutor that are Diabolic Tutor and all that stuff. So there are ways to get other tutor effects that aren't as expensive. Yeah. Um, the power in tutors comes with how cheap they are. Just like I said, with that card draw, like Wheel of Fortune at three is better yeah. than five because you can deploy the spells afterwards. A two mana tutor can let you search up a board wipe and cast and the board cast wipe. It. Yeah, you know what I mean? Turn. Like a five mana tutor. A little bit less so. Yeah, like I'm not casting a damnation after a five mana tutor. Like I just can't. Ah. But uh, after a demonic tutor, or yeah, I, I probably can. I figured it out. It's Vizier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Blue actually had a really great tutor printed in Strixhaven. This card, I think, is abs it's one, it's really cheap. Yeah. Two, you could just play this in so many decks. It's solve the equation. Two in the blue sorcery. Search your library for an instant or sorcery. Reveal it. Put it into your hand. Shuffle. So solve the equation is just a great rate. Three mana is totally reasonable to pay for getting something. And in blue, you're oftentimes getting instants and sorceries. So that seems perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I like this next edition. I've never really played this card or seen it played. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, it's a good one. Go for it. Monvoli Beast Tracker. One green, green for a 2 1. When it enters the battlefield, search your library for a creature card with Death Touch, Hexproof, Reach, or Trample, and reveal it. Shuffle your library and put that card on top of it. So it's a creature tutor. It's for three mana. And so that's not the most efficient things. And it's pretty limiting, but you can make sure that there are some key things in your deck that fit that. Uh, acidic Slime. Ah, that has death, touch. death Touch. You know, and actually a lot of the big uh, overrun creatures have Trample right. on them. Uh, in green, there are some big utility creatures like spiders and stuff like that that do other things but also have reach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. you're going to be surprised at how many cards have great interaction and have those keywords on it. 
Yeah, not to mention, it doesn't have to be a green creature. Could be a green deck with blue creatures, black creatures, and those will have Death Touch or Hexproof or whatever mm-hmm. it is. Yeah, it's, now to the top of your library, not as good, but you are able to draw that card at some point, and so that's pretty powerful there. All right, next up we got Fierce Empath. Uh, which is a another kind of uh, similar a little bit to, to Mwan Volley. It's two in the green. When it enters the battlefield, search your library for a creature card with CMC th- six or more, and this one goes straight into your hand. So I played this in my Animar deck because I have so many big things and I can play this for just one green mana, but still two in the green to get a one of your sort of like game-ending threats seems pretty good. Yeah, and you don't want to have a ton of six to eight drops. You no. just don't No. you know? And so if you have a one or two or one specifically that works with your strategy, it could be good to get it. Um, like these are not that uh, great of tutors. And so if you want to up the power level, you can up the budget along with it. Yeah. <laughs> like survival of the fittest. I don't know. That's worldly that's, tutor. Yeah. These are very powerful, very good, but they're expensive. So yeah. I actually think that a good, let's talk about a good middle ground. Um, I think that Primal Command oh, nice. might be a good middle ground. Uh, three green green for a sorcery, choose two. Target player gains seven life. Put target per, uh, non-creature permanent on top of its owner's library. Uh, target player shuffles his or her graveyard into their library. Or search your library for a creature card, put in your hand, then shuffle your library. So this can be that creature that you need, but it can also be that removal that kind of time walks your opponent by putting it on top of their... their Yeah, you can choose two. It's five mana, so it's really flexible, though there's a lot you can do with that card. Sometimes you just want to gain the life, too. Mm -hmm. Um, White's got a couple of options. Search for Glory is a new one from Kaldheim. It allows you to find a snow permanent card, a legendary card, or a saga card for two and a white to go into your hand. Uh, That's kind of cool. Yeah, one thing though is that some of these tutors are very narrow, and so it can go, it can kind of go against the strategy where it's like, okay, I have this tutor that Ah, should be able to get my strategy going. You know what I mean? Get my engine going, get the card I need, and when it's narrow, you're like, oh great. I uh, yes, I have asked, I have access to Elspeth Conquer's death, a basic snow land and but the cool thing is you, you know, a legendary creature yeah, but, legendaries. Yeah. But you're like, I need I need a panharmonicon. Do you know what I mean? Like I need Yeah, I need, I need this a lightning shooter, not this one. Exactly. Yeah. But it's still really good if you if you find that you've got a bunch of legendary creatures and all that, snow search for glory could fit that really well. Um, open the armory for anyone that likes equipment decks or aura decks. You search your library for an aura and equipment and put it into your hand for one in a white. That's that to me feels like demonic tutor, but for specifically auras or equipment. <laughs> Again, narrow because it's, you're limited to the strategy, but it's cheap enough that you're like, all right, you know, if I have this 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 complement of tutors, like a pretty big set of tutors, all these yeah. different narrow ones, you can kind of hopefully find one of each tutor that can go in and make your deck worthwhile. Yeah, I would say take a look at this list and ask yourself, hey, you know what? I actually love legendary cards. Search for Glory seems like a great add to what I'm going here. Or I'm, I am just the equipment person. Open the armory. I need more mm-hmm. copies of it. Okay, let's move on to our last grouping here. It is removal slash interaction. Fortunately, this is a very full-up topic, and we've talked about lots of these cards before, so we won't Mm -hmm. read all of them. But having a set of, I'm playing white, I'm putting these things in. It's my three spells I know I'm always going to use for removal in my board white. Just feels so good. You don't need to search around for, you know, your Wrath of God or whatever it is. You just have them on hand. And I actually think that three three might not be enough, and it depends on your play group. Uh, but I think that three is a good starting point because you have a piece of efficient removal. Mm-hmm. Hopefully it's like single target. You have something that answers multiple threats. Like a board wipe. Like a board wipe. And you have something that provides another level of utility and hopefully card advantage along with it. Um, we'll, we'll get to those and you'll see it's kind of the theme that we have. So in white... I think that Swords to Plowshares is great. It's cheap. It's, it's one great. of the best ones. Path to Exile Swords to Plowshares. I, I mean, you, you, I just randomly pick up copies of this over time, and then now I have a bunch of them, and I'm always glad to see it in my binder because I can take it out, and I know it's going to get used and probably make a big difference. Perfect. White has uh, a huge number of board wipes to choose from. So many. I've chosen Farewell here uh, because, you know, it's four white, white, and choose one or more. Exile all artifacts, all creatures, all enchantments, all graveyards. Ah. And so being able to pick and choose means that this can naturally go in many more decks. Because if you're doing an artifact strategy, you just don't choose artifacts mm-hmm. on farewell. Mm-hmm. You know, If, if you have a graveyard strategy, you don't do that one either. Exactly. And so basically this is really flexible in a binder, in a staple binder, because it can naturally fit into any deck. Whereas something like 
slash the ranks or something else right might, a little go, more. might, might be more narrow and go in a little bit of a different deck yeah farewell is just the a big whammy of a uh, of a board wipe there there's also like winds of abandon that allows you to overload it and exile all creatures you don't control pretty crazy this or just by my, itself you can just exile yeah. a single creature this is in my sort of flexible category because winds of abandon can be single target or yeah. large removal uh and so i like that if you are building a deck that you don't know exactly what you need having something more flexible is great uh or something like Forsake the Worldly. Uh, two and a white for an instant. Exile target artifact or enchantment with cycling two. Ah, the flexibility. I talked about cycling, how it could be really important to get what you need to, get to what you need to. Mm -hmm. And so cycling it away is fantastic. Yeah, Black's got a lot as well in terms of board wipes. The expensive ones are like Damnation or Toxic Deluge. Those but are better. Crux of Fate, great. I, Just, yeah, solid. Right? So easy. Destroy all non-dragon creatures. Done. Done, exactly. But if you have the budget, Damnation and... and Talks to tell you are just better. Yeah, and those cards also see reprints we've seen pretty occasionally. Single target removal, you also have your choice. You yeah. Know, you have a lot of different things. Uh, Curtain's Call just got reprinted. Great and that's card. Why, that's why I've chosen that one for this. It's, uh, well, it's a lot of mana, but if you're playing a four-player game of Magic, it ends up being two and a black for an instant. Uh, destroy two target creatures. Wow, that's really good rate. That's, that's gr really, a really great rate. rate. Gets rid of creatures, instant speed, solid. Yeah. Um, and then we have sort of the black flexibility does a lot of different things. I've chosen the oldest reborn, uh, five and a black for a four saga a Four and a black. <laughs> what a rate. What a rate. Uh, four and a black for a saga. This is like a seven for one. It's insane. Okay. Yeah. So each opponent sacrifices a creature on turn one. Yeah. When yeah. it comes out. Yep. Uh, or planeswalker. So sacrifice, sacrifice, fast sacrifice three for one. Amazing. Okay. Goes on to the next mode. Each opponent discards a card oh rock discard oh. discard 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 now it's six for one and then on the last part of the saga you get to reanimate something uh that's one more piece of fantastic card advantage seven for one on this crazy spell does a lot takes a while for it to get going but it could be one of those spells that again you just have in your decks then you know it's always going to perform it's always going to do some well not always but it's going to do some work exactly it's not as granted sometimes you want something targeted you need to answer yeah. that specific thing but this is in the third category where you can just take a lot of value uh and put that in your deck all right let's move on to green here beast within is the most classic you can destroy a permanent which is great you can even get rid of a land at two and green for an instant kill a thing i don't care about that three three you get yeah you get they get a three three green beast uh three three green cassius marsh but that's nothing compared to the guy's cradle or whatever it is you just took out Green doesn't have a lot of board wipes per se, but they do have some things that interact with the board in general. Specifically, they have great ways of getting rid of a ton of artifacts and enchantments. Yeah. Uh, Bane of Progress wipes the board of artifacts and enchantments and it gets super big along the way. I am actually going to advocate for people to start playing Bane of Progress more because it really, I've seen so many situations where I go, well, my single target removal does nothing, but a Bane of Progress would solve this issue immediately. As good as Dockside Extortionist is, we know how good it is. Yeah. Now it lets you know that we should be playing more Banes of Progresses, right? Yeah, certainly. I mean, <laughs> in general, even against Enchantress decks and all the new Enchantress things, DJ, you know this quite well. Yes, I do. Um, a card <laughs> that we were both really excited about, uh, Pest Infestation. I was super excited about it, and I still love it, and I don't think it sees enough play. It's great. XX green, destroy up to X target artifacts and or enchantments, and you create twice X, one, one, black and green pest creature tokens with, when this creature dies, you gain one life. Sometimes you don't need to take out everything. You just need to pick and choose that, that, that that and then boom yeah. take him out you got some pests it's got that great two for one value on it's fantastic yep 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 very powerful and then finally we have uh, Kenrith's transformation when a green for an enchantment or enchant creature uh, when it enters the battlefield draw a card and that creature loses all abilities just becomes an elk Really awful for commanders to get hit with Kenneth's Transformation, especially oh if they don't gosh. have a sacrifice outlet. You also get to draw a card. That's, the drawing the card is great because that's I was, the big one. yeah, like I was talking about how great cycling was on that, uh, on that other stuff. Like yeah. if you're just trying to cycle it away, you have a, you have a three, three, you could just be like, all right, Jimmy, your three, three is now also a three, three. I'm going to cycle <laughs> this, but I'm going to cycle this and draw a card. I'm going to get one yeah. deeper. You could even turn one of your one ones into a three, three. If you just want to get one deeper, you know, so getting, getting one deeper is pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, in blue rapid hybridization. This is a blue man for an instant destroy creature. And then they make a three, three green frog lizard creature token. Not as good. I think as beast with him. Cause I guess rid of permanence, but still one blue destroy creature in blue. Pretty nice. Cheap interaction. Uh, blue has a lot of bounce when it comes to dealing with the board. And yep. so like evacuation is fine. You know, Cyclonic Rift is expensive. So Wash talking out about this is list. another option. That yeah. just got but I actually am a big fan of Ixodron. Oh, man. To, yeah. When it comes to controlling the board, Ixodron comes down and then all non-token creatures 
just flip over and become boring tutus. Yep. That they includes have, your commander. Your commander yep. is stranded on the battlefield, flipped over as just a random tutu. And no one has abilities and they can't flip them over because they don't have morph on them. So mm -hmm. they just become tutus. This is a great board equalizer. You could even hold back on playing your commander and play Exodron first. Mm -hmm. Really get people. I, I think that this is one of the best actual board wipes in blue. I mean, people talk about um, Curse of the Swine being a pseudo board wipe. Right. That also turns things into tutus. Yeah. Just yeah, Exodron yeah. way cheaper and you have a gigantic creature on the battlefield. It's amazing. Yeah. And of course, when it comes to interaction, blue just has counter spells. So regular counter spells have been printed a bunch of times, but there are some options that are actually a little more flexible, especially when we're building with this sort of need to see my deck and want to try it out in mind. Exactly. You might not always, uh, you might not always have the deck that wants to keep up mana for a counter spell. Yeah. Um, you might not have built that in, but if you have counter spells so you can counter when you need to, but get rid of the card when you don't is fantastic. So neutralize lets you cycle it away. So if you are at a board state where you need to protect it, or you know Jimmy's about to go off, you got your counter spell. But if you're developing or if you need that land drop, cycle it away. Yeah. Um, I think the better version is Archmage's Charm. Yeah, but that's blue, 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 so even harder to cast. And it's more expensive. Right. And so uh, that'll draw you two cards when you cast it, which is great. It actually is that card draw. Yeah. You can steal a soul ring, which is fantastic. Oh, oh man. Encounter spell. I love the utility, but again, blue, 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 and price tag means that maybe you don't even focus on that. Yeah, you could just have counter spell in your binder, and that would work out quite the, just fine. Uh, red, obviously, Chaos Warp, two and a red, instant any permanent, but they shuffle their library and, and flip something off the top. They may get the card back or something crazy. What crazier. are they even going to get? Come on. How yeah. bad could it be, Jimmy? Could be a land. Could be bad. Yeah, it could be a blight steal. <laughs> um, so Chaos Warp is just, that's an absolute staple. We've seen this card get reprinted a ton of times. You're always happy putting this into a deck that can play it, even if you're not mono red. So I like this card a lot. Removal, we've got Blasphemous Act, one of the best removal, like board wipes in. It's red. amazing because red has a lot of damage based board wipes, but Blasphemous Act for being able to be able to cast it for one red and pretty much get rid of the board keeps this as actually one of the best board wipes. Wipes, even though damage based board wipes aren't that amazing in commander and compared to just straight up destroy creatures things that are a little bit more flexible jimmy was mentioning damage based board wipes i think that some of them that do less damage can be good i yeah. actually really like burn down the house oh i love this card yeah five damage to everything but that includes planeswalkers so that can address different types of creatures on the board but if you don't want a board wipe it just creates devils yep Three and one ones, and when they die, they deal one damage to uh, any target. Anyone. So devils can those devils can be like sack fodder. They can, but most importantly, what they can do is help you stabilize. Uh, burn down the house can help you stabilize in a lot of different ways, whether it's wiping the board of mm -hmm. creatures or planeswalkers, or getting those devils on the battlefield to be able to pressure certain things. Yep. Um, so I think it's quite good. Um, I'm also a big fan of flame blitz. Yeah, because it cycles for two, but at the beginning of your end step, it deals five damage to each planeswalker. So if you have a super friends d deck in your meta, flame blitz just obliterates them. Oh, it's so mean. Uh, but again, it's that cycling. So yeah. it's narrow, but it cycles. Yeah. When it comes to colorless, not as many options. You do have Nevin Rell's disc, but we've talked about why we don't love this card. It comes into play tapped. Everyone knows you're going to use it, so they just start swinging at you. But it's an option. I still play it in a lot of decks if I just need an option for a board wipe. Uh, and then you also have like Oblivion Stone and stuff too. But again, a little clunkier. You're just much better off finding a board wipe in the colors you're in. Mm -hmm. And then Meteor Golem, just seven mana comes down, destroy a non-land permanent and opponent controls. There's also Scour from Existence, I think. It's none, seven mana for an none instant. Of these are, none of these are really what we want, but they're cheap enough that you could just add them to your, to your binder. Yeah, and there's a reason you'll see Meteor Golem just pop up in the random pre-con. It's because it's like, cool, seven mana, what do you get? You just get a spell that blows up a permanent because mm -hmm. you kind of need that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that is going to cover all of the different topics here. Now, look, you don't need to buy all these cards immediately. In fact, don't. Yeah, don't. Don't. Yeah. Think about what your collection needs. In fact, you may already have a lot of these cards. In fact, you may think of cards that we didn't even think about, which is obviously to the listeners. But every single player, I think, has their own version of these. I'm not as hot on the cycling cards, but I still love them. And I'll still play, you know, all those cycling lands that have cycle two on them that come into play tab just because... You know, sometimes you want to draw that land early. Sometimes if you draw it late, you just want to make sure that you still have the lands in your deck, but you can get through them and find something else. I think that the most important I idea is that when you're brewing, when you're deck building, give yourself the most options to be able to have your deck function and have fun playing commander. Yeah, totally. Uh, and that's why I love the smoothers category. I love just building decks for functionality first and then refining from there. And remember commander decks, building them is a process and having this uh, set of tools 
can be part of the process and make things better. But this is just the starting point, you know, try your decks out, you know, play with friends, get feedback from other people, be really critical of how your deck is working. And this adding this to the process of deck building is going to make your decks more interesting. They're going to make them cooler. They're going to make them more your own. Yeah. Uh, And you're going to really enjoy the process of developing commander decks, which I think is something that a lot of people enjoy. It's not just about playing the decks. It's about, about building them and making them yours and uh, refining everything. Yeah. So to the listeners, let us know if there are any cards that you think we missed in our sort of staples must have commander cards or some hidden gems that you love to play in your deck that you wish more people knew about. And guess what? Now's your chance to tell everyone in the comment section. You can also message us as well. And if you're going to buy any of these cards, you're going to pick them up. We'll pick them up from the right place. That's right. Channelfireball.com slash command. That's our affiliate code. That's all you have to enter to visit their marketplace, buy some sealed products, buy some cards, do whatever you want but get the cards that you need delivered to your door from a local game store that you're supporting. I can't express how important that is today, especially given the nature of the world and the nature of how game stores have been doing or not doing. So go to the Channel Fireball Marketplace, enter command at checkout, or just go to channelfireball.com slash command. When you get those cards, shop.ultrapro.com slash command. In fact, do this at the same time that you're on Channel Fireball because you know you're going to get a deck. You're going to need 100, car- 100 sleeves to put it around it. Perfect. Shop.ultraworld.com slash command. They got tons of deals. I can't express it enough. Just go check it out. Even if you don't buy anything, you will be surprised. I guarantee you. Buy something on there. You're like, wait, that cost what? No way. That's a great deal. If you're going to be brewing with your decks, you also need the sleeves and the other things to go with it. You yeah, know what I mean? Put all the cards on. So yeah. Get like, so you got your sleeves and you're like, all right, brew with these staples. Yep. Let's get the sleeves out too. <laughs> all right. Big thanks to everyone here at the Command Zone. Damon Lenz, Shauna Gillis, Arthur Mellicroft, Ashlyn Rose, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Craig Blanchett, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Josh Lee Kwai, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Waller, Garov Goliath, Truck Ty, Jamie Block, Mitch Trafford, and Evan Limburger. And where can we find Jumbo Commander? You can find me on YouTube, Jumbo Commander. You can also find me on Twitter, at Jumbo Commander. Very simple, yes. very easy. Just making look for making the content on the internet. Yeah. Content, always be contenting. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for stopping by. As always, DJ, love your opinions and your viewpoints on Commander. Oh, thank you, Jimmy. And as always, special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer. He does those cool living card animations that start our show on YouTube. You can find them on Twitter, at Living Cards MTG. All right, everyone, I'm going to go organize my binders. Sounds great. (laughs) Bye. Thanks. Thank you for your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans.